From the dawn of man, indigenous people from every corner of the globe have spoken of things that have now been discounted as myth or legend. Things they saw, lived alongside by, were looked upon as deities or worshipped by gods. Things that present-day man refer to as entities, spirits, demons, cryptid creatures, extraterrestrials and much more. But sadly, modern man, science and society has discounted what our ancestors spoke of as legend and myths. But there are those of us that know what the ancient ones spoke of is the truth. Those of us who are obsessed with finding out the truth. This search for answers brings us into the world of the unknown and unexplained. It brings us on the trail, in search of living legends. Please join us tonight in another part of our journey to find these answers and bring the truth out into the light. Welcome and thank you for listening. everybody this is jeremiah fountain welcome to episode seven of on the trail the search for living legends uh got a great show for you planned tonight um joined by my usual co-host jr kitchen how you doing jr sir hey man real good how about you that's good I, i'm excellent i, I can't can't complain I'm real excited about tonight's uh, interview yeah, um, me- Definitely excited for sure. Um, also, as usual, we got Sean with us, Sean Wilson, out of Nebraska. Sean, how are you? Good, man. How you guys doing? Super. Can't can't awesome. complain. Awesome. Cannot complain whatsoever. It's been a bit. I know it's been a busy week for all of us, but uh, you know, I think it'll it, it's going to work out for us. You know, it'll pay off. <laughs> um, anyway, let me introduce our witness. We got Mr. Joe Vogel. I've uh, been real excited for this interview. Uh, we spoke on the phone, what, Joe, about two weeks ago, a week ago? Uh, yeah, Jeremiah, yeah, about a week ago. Yeah, we. Uh, he kind of went through some of his stuff with me, extremely fascinating stuff. I can't wait to, to let y'all hear it. Uh, so without further ado, welcome, Joe. It's an honor to have you on the show. Thank you for agreeing to do this. We, we truly appreciate it. Well, thank you guys. I really appreciate you guys. It's always nice. Like I said, it's always nice to chat with like-minded folks. When Absolutely. It comes to this um, Absolutely. So you want to give us a quick uh, quick bio? or? Yeah, sure. Absolutely, man. Um, I grew up uh, in Western Pennsylvania. I was born and raised in Pennsylvania. Uh, I lived there for 40 years uh, total. But uh, grew up there and, and outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, area, Pittsburgh, in the Pittsburgh area, in, in, a, in a spot known as the Laurel, Laurel Highlands, which mm-hmm. is part of the uh, Chestnut Ridge, uh, Laurel Ridge Network. Okay. So, uh, you know, odd goings on and uh, things of uh, paranormal activity, uh, paranormal you know, nature were kind of commonplace to an extent. And, mm-hmm. uh, but I never really uh, paid much mind to it. I just I was just a kid growing up, you know. Yeah. I got married at a young age. I got married when I was uh, nineteen uh, after graduating high school. I was just finishing up my stint in the National Guard, and uh, I, I decided to get married and have a kid. And uh, I went to a nursing school. Mm-hmm. I initially signed up for two programs. I signed up for a power lineman program. And I signed up for nursing school. I knew to- totally different sides of a coin. But, right. And, uh, but the nursing school called first. So I went ahead and did that thing. Uh, graduated nursing school. I've been a nurse for 32 years. Wow. Um, pretty much raised my kids and my family there in the, in the Latrobe, uh, Ligonier Dairy area. Okay. And, uh, in 2010, I retired, semi-retired, and I moved out west to Idaho. Initially, I had moved actually to Pullman, Washington, but I was only down there for about a year before buying a home up here in, in north, uh, northern Idaho Panhandle. 
Um, and I've been here for uh, 10 years. So I envy you. It's beautiful out there. And it really is. Um, honestly, uh, couldn't ask for a better terrain for to do literally anything. Anything. Yeah. Anything. You know, it's water sports. We have ginormous, pristine mountain lakes, mm. rivers galore, uh, mountains, super high peaks, uh, you know, rocky. It's, I live on the western slope of the Rockies. If I look nice. out my front window, I can see the western slope of the Rockies off in the distance. Beautiful. In a hunter's paradise, I'd imagine as well. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, the white tails aren't that big out here, but the yeah, I imagine are enormous. Elk. The elk are enormous. The moose mm-hmm. are enormous as well. And then, of course, yeah. there's every kind of bear you can imagine, and every sure. kind of wild cat that could possibly roam. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and you have grizzly. There's grizzly in that part of Idaho, if I'm not oh, mistaken. Yeah, yeah, about, if you drive about 20 minutes north, you get into the beginning of grizzly okay. territory towards the Cabinet Mountains. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Here in the, in the summertime, uh, a lot of people. The big hobby is to pick uh, huckleberries. Okay. And going huckleberry hunting is essentially, you know, flirting with disaster because you're hunting the same thing that the bears are hunting. Mm-hmm. So everybody, pretty much everybody that tra- that huckleberry hunts always has an armed guard. Like there'll be like three or four people picking huckleberries and one or two people with uh, like a shotgun with slugs or double odd buck in it. Sure. Right. I mean, it's you know, standing guard definitely just safe. Somebody's. Yeah, but um, other than that, man, it's really nice here. There's no snakes. There's no poisonous snakes in this area. It's kind of a geographical oddity because if I yeah. drive, if I drive thirty minutes west towards into Washington, they mm-hmm. have rattlesnakes over there. Yeah. And if I drive an hour south, they have rattlesnakes down there. But there are no rattlesnakes for about a hundred mile radius where I'm at. It is kind of strange, huh? That's awesome. It is because we we get the altitude and the the terrain. Yeah. Right. Right. But, you know, if you go down <laughs> south towards what's called the Lewiston Clarkston Valley, uh, that's just, that's where the Snake River is. That that area is polluted with rattlesnakes, man. <laughs> so, well, other than that, we have pretty much every kind of wildlife you can imagine. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, if you go a little bit to east, you run into the, uh, you know, the Bighorn Sheep Territory. Mm-hmm. What about so, Mountain Goat? You know, a little further north, you run into the Mountain Goats. Oh, so, yeah. Beautiful. That's my actually. That's actually my dream hunt. To be honest with you, mountain goat. Um, I saw a moose about five years ago, man. I swear, this thing was as big as a freaking fifth wheel trailer. This, this thing was. He was standing on top of a hill, probably about a mile away from me, and it looked like a house. So, oh yeah. yeah. I, I had to double take it because I was like, I cannot believe there is a thing that enormous stomping through the woods around here. He had like you know the, the larger moose get those big beards that hang down the yep. big. This thing was almost touching the ground. It was a, wow. it was enormous. A beautiful sight. I wish I would have had my camera. They are beautiful. People don't understand like uh, how big moose actually are until you get next to one <laughs> or get a good sighting of one. You know. But yeah, but yeah. Out here, um, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm sure we'll get to it here shortly. But as I was saying, I grew up there in Pennsylvania, and I had my first encounter as a kid. Okay. And in 2007, my stepson had, a, had an encounter, and then right there in Derry, and then when I moved out west here in 2011, I, I had another encounter, and I'm really, honestly, I'm done with the encounters. Please, I'm done with them. I don't, I don't, <laughs> want, I don't want any more encounters, okay? I don't mind seeing a tree structure or finding <laughs> a little bit of sign or finding a footprint. But I, I'm done with seeing these things, man. These things are terrifying, you know. They're not pretty to look at, that's for sure. No, no, <laughs> especially that last one. You know, that thing was absolutely horrible, man. I, I, I just, I don't know what to say. Um, I've <laughs> been a lifelong believer, of course, because I saw one as a child. And I had to go through my entire life, you know, either hiding that fact or telling people about it and being either ridiculed or, you know, some people were curious and wanted to know more. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the many people that were believers when I was younger, but when the event occurred, I didn't tell anybody. I I, I was I was too. I don't know. I just kept it myself. I don't know why I kept it to myself. I it was just something I held on to, and, and I didn't want to get into it with people anyway. Right. Well, people I, very I, judgmental. I, 
And yeah. I don't really need that at the time anyway. So, right. But uh, yeah, I've uh, I've had three. I mean, I personally have had two sighting encounters, and I, I I've had a couple other things happen in the woods that you know, as I was telling you the other day about the growl that came to the abandoned house. Yes. You know that was. <clears throat> Still unexplained. I can't say yes that that was a Sasquatch because I didn't see it. You didn't see it, right? But I couldn't believe it being anything else. The you way, it, yeah, just from the way it growled at you. I, yeah, I understand what you're yeah, saying. That, sure. that time that something chased me out of the woods on the four wheeler. You know, I, yeah, I, that's I, right. I, I never looked back. I never Forgot, looked back because I forgot about I that. Yeah, I did not <laughs> want to look back. I don't blame I've you. Heard, you know, I've heard tree knocks and stuff. Uh, just a couple, uh, two summers ago, uh, we went down to an area called Cascade, uh, Idaho, which okay. is uh, a big recreation area. There's a big giant lake there. The beautiful white sandy beaches and stuff. And it's just gorgeous. Like, you, you wouldn't believe you were at the beach. It's just right. so pretty. The water's blue and there's like pelicans and shit. And, uh, so we're down there, uh, at night sitting on the deck of, we rented a large, uh, cabin through Airbnb. Um, essentially a, wood, a, a wooded home. And we were sitting out on the back deck, you know, and I, I just got the feeling there was something around us. And I kept hearing little, like, kept hearing little twig breaks on and off in the right. woods. And I told my wife, I said, I think they're here. I think there's something around watching us. Mm-hmm. And uh, just a couple of seconds later, there was a beautiful, absolutely pristine wood knock. I mean, it was mm. it was absolutely perfect. And then a few seconds after that, a, a beautiful, just loud as hell branch break. So, you know, you wonder about stuff like that. Like, was that were those Sasquatches? I'm going to say yes. Yeah, it, that's their behavior. So right, right. And you, you, you know, like you were saying, that was my wife's first encounter. I'm sorry to keep interrupting. No, I, I that was my fault. I, all I was going to say was uh, we got actually got talking about that last night. You know, usually in most cases, when you hear stuff like that or, or whatever, if you don't actually see it, you can't really be sure. But it's pretty safe to say that st- when it comes to stuff like that, you know, when you hear stuff as you just described, it's pretty safe to say, you know, yeah, that was probably a Sasquatch. You know, like I've, I've been in campsites where like small, like little pebbles, yeah, flying in and just land off to the side somewhere, you know. Or, um, I was in a tent once that got pelted a few times by something that was throwing something at our tent. I don't know, I couldn't see out, so I don't know mm-hmm. what it was, you know, but. right? But you probably, you probably, you probably got a good idea what it was. Yeah, it could, been, it, could been a squirrel, it could have been a squirrel eating up in a tree, dropping pieces sure. of nuts down. Sure. Like, I don't know. But like you said, I have an idea. I have my, you know, with whether it was my imagination or not, you know, I, right. I know, I know what was out there throwing little pebbles at my tent. So right, exactly. Well, you want to start? Uh, can you give us? Um, you want to start with your first encounter when you were a kid? Can you give sure. us any detail and give us as much detail as you can on that? Yeah, um, I'll try to wrap it up as quick as I can. I get yeah, a lot yeah, of take your time. People. I get a lot of flack from people for, uh, for, for, you know, for telling too too much detail. Hey, um, you're not going to get it from us. I just try to make it simple. Sounds good. Um, it was right after Christmas, uh, December uh, two thousand. I'm sorry, December of 1979. Uh, my dad was working down in Baton Rouge, <clears throat> doing a big electrical job down there. And he had come home for the holiday, and he had flowed out on December 26th, which is a Sunday, I think. I, I can't remember. But anyway, uh, a couple of days later, um, uh, one of the gifts I had gotten for Christmas was this blue plastic sled. Mm-hmm. I don't know what they're called. I can't remember. It's called like a super, su- super surfer or something. It's, it's a sled that rolls up. And it's awful. They're terrible sleds. Don't ever buy one. <laughs> They're a waste of money. They were just a marketing thing. And anyway. Yeah, so I had a red one. The Wednesday <laughs> after, um, after everything calmed down and all the kids, we were all on break, you know. Everybody finally got together and uh, we got to play the day. We had to go uh, sled riding. So I sled, went sled riding at my friend Chucky Thompson's house for about uh, four hours from like noon to four 
And it was really cold that day, and we had had a heck of a nice snowstorm prior. So there was about two to three feet of snow on the ground in the local area. Mm -hmm. Plow trucks had been through and had piled, piled huge piles of snow up on the sides of the road. And, you know, you couldn't walk anywhere, you know, unless you had snowshoes on. You couldn't walk through the, the deep snow. So <clears throat> went up there, sled ride, and about 4 o'clock, right around dark time, getting towards dusk. I was like, I got to go home. I'm cold. I want to get something to eat. And my mom was a nurse who worked the afternoon shift. And I knew she would have dinner waiting for me when I got home. And she had already left for work. And I, so I started walking home. It was about a half a mile. And I had to go through, uh, I had to follow the roads. I couldn't follow or couldn't do my normal diagonal cut through the woods and across the fields because of the snow. So I got down to the main road, which is an old country lane called um, Old Distillery Road. And uh, as I was walking to the crest of it, my parents' driveway was about 100 feet in front of me to the left. And just the prior year, a family uh, named the Riffles had built a house across the, the road from us. Mm -hmm. uh, his name was John Riffle, and uh, it was a, the, the road was about three miles long total, and there was only about 10 houses on it at the time, and most of the houses were farms, so it was, everything was very far apart. Right. And there was no traffic. It was snowing lightly, and it was dead silent. And I'm walking as I'm cresting this little bit of a knob. As soon as I got to the top of the hill, across the road, about 50 feet in front of me, walked a, a Sasquatch, boom, just walked straight across the road right in front of me. Like it didn't even, didn't even give me the time of day. It didn't even look at me. I, I would, I would almost to this day, I still think it didn't even see me. Really? And it walked straight across the road and it went behind one of these big snow banks that the plow truck had plowed up. And of course that locked me dead in my spot. Oh, yeah. You know, um, to, to describe the creature, it was uh, roughly around seven feet tall. I had long, very long gray uh, hair um, and a dark gray. I, I call it light. It's darker than Battleship, almost like a charcoal gray. Uh -huh. And uh, it had, like, uh, hair on its fingers and wrists that hung down below its fingers. Uh, and it's, it's, as it walked across the road, I could see the hair on its head, like, blowing back in the wind, you know, from the wow. And uh, its face was all hair covered below the eyes. Mm -hmm. And it had, uh, it was a very lanky creature. It was very tall and lanky, like a basketball player. Okay. I, would, I mean, you know, everybody's, everybody's impersonation or pers every t everybody's envisionment of these creatures is they're always these giant behemoths. That are yeah. Huge. And it, it, it kind of caught me off guard because at first I'm thinking, okay, what the hell is that? <laughs> so I went in for a second, and I backed up. I backpedaled a little bit so I could get around the other side of that snowbank. Yeah. And I watched it walk as it walked. It continued to walk. It walked right down my neighbor's driveway and went right, turned left, went right behind his house towards a grove of trees, which stood behind the house. And uh, I, for, I, I was totally frozen. I didn't know what to do. And I was terrified that it was gonna that it was gonna come back. I, I felt no threat from this creature. I had no bad vibe. It was like, mm -hmm. like I said, I didn't even know it saw me. It, it, it kind of like I, I kind of like, you know, later on in life, I'm like, damn, that thing didn't even see me. Didn't even know I was there. So I, I finally got up the nerve to run, and I just bolted for my parents' house. And I got in the house. And we had a really long driveway, of course, and I got in there and. Got in my room, shut the door, I locked the house up tight, turned all the lights off, and went to bed. I just... I don't blame you. <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't even eat dinner. I didn't, I didn't even eat dinner. I remember what my mom made, too. She made pork chops with onion gravy. And I never... I didn't even touch it. She asked me about it the next morning. She's like, why didn't you eat? And I'm like, ah, because I, I got home late from Chucky's, and I just went to bed, and I was so cold. I wanted to warm up. And I just... I didn't know how to approach it with her. Yeah. It's hard. I didn't know what to say. Hey, mom, by the way. 
I saw a Bigfoot. I saw a Bigfoot walk across the road in front of my house. <laughs> so, um, I, I, and, uh, you know, I, uh, during, the, during the sighting, I called out for Mr. Riffle. I was like, hey, oh, Mr. Okay. Riffle. You know, Mr. Riffle, because I thought maybe he just was wearing a ski suit or something. I don't know. Right. And it wasn't him because his truck wasn't there. He had a 77 Ford Ranger back when the Ranger was a real truck. Remember? Yep. Yep. The back in the way, way back in the day. My yeah. dad liked this truck. Yeah, my dad liked this truck so much he bought an Explorer the next year. So that's why I, I really <laughs> remember that, you know. They were both green. He bought the same, pretty much the same exact truck. It was just a Ford Explorer, which was another trim package. Right, yeah. right. So um, it, it, it was, uh, you know, it was very, very unique feeling. And um, I really never spoke about it because I knew people would pick on me. I knew people would give me a rough time. Oh, sure. So, they always do. What was the point, you know? Yeah. And then, you know, the the world back then was, you know, this was only, this would have been, you know, just like 12 years after the Patterson-Gimlin film was shot. So the Bigfoot thing was still really, you know, becoming uh, more popular and people were more aware of it. And I knew about it. I was, as soon as I saw it, I was like, well, that, that proves that. You know, I don't need any more evidence for the rest of my days. I just, I saw one and just... I always said it was, a, it walked across the road like it was going to market. It was, took about four <laughs> steps across the road and it was gone. You know, it, it just trekked down. And I didn't, I didn't, lo- I didn't stop to look for footprints or anything like that. People always ask me, well, did you look for a footprint? Like, no, no so you I, get the hell out of there. <laughs> I, I, I had other things on my mind. Yeah. You know, right. and, uh, but I can, you know, visually, I can see it. I close my eyes. I can see this thing. Mm-hmm. It's embedded in your brain forever. Yeah. So it really is. Number one. No, uh, you mind if we ask you a couple questions about that? Anything yeah. you want, man. Anything you want. Um, yeah. Tell us what it looked uh, like. Go ahead, Jay. You go first. Yes, sir. If you don't mind, Joe, just to, just can can you give us a description of kind of what you saw? Like like how big was this thing? What color and stuff? It was a seven feet tall. It was a dark charcoal brown or charcoal gray. It had long hair. I would put its body length hair at about six inches. Almost yep. all over its entire body. Yes, it had bigger feet. Um, it had, uh, you know, um, there was snow on its fur or on its hair, on its shoulders, and on its head. Oh, it cool. had, um, like I said, and as it walked, the hair on its temples, like its long head hair, was blowing back in the wind. Wow. And uh, it, 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 I, I saw on the side, like I said, its face was hair covered, almost looked like it was bearded, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, they said the only thing that shocked me about it was how thin it was. Now, yeah, I often thought about it. Why was it thin? You know, because it was just winter time. Maybe it needed some food. Or could um, you think it could have been an adolescent? No, I think it could have been elderly, if anything. Or, or an elderly. Yeah, that's true too. True. Um, I think it being at the height that it was, it was definitely. Um, I would say it was a male. I didn't see any genitalia from the side. Right. Or anything like that, you know. So yeah. I, I, I can only you assume. Probably would have seen the breast, the though. But it did. It just strode across the thing. But it walked upright, leaning slightly forward. It had um, the, the prominent pointed head. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can actually see this one's head. It had more of a, a differentiation between the head and the shoulders. Where the creature I saw here in Idaho was just all shoulders. Mm. You know, was, like the thing I saw here was just a brute. But this creature just reminded me of uh, built like a basketball player. Yeah, we've heard that description, you know, and yeah. brings you to my next question. Do you think, uh, not to go too, not to jump ahead, but, you know, do you think it might have been a different type of creature than what you've experienced in Idaho? Okay. Different type of creature, I can't say for sure. Right, of course, just speculation, of course. Just as all human beings are different. Yeah. I'm 6'4", yeah. 300 pounds. Oh, you're, okay. Okay, so I'm a big dude. Yeah. How big are you? About 5'10", okay. 205. So, you, know, I, you know, and you're probably athletically built. You used to box, right? So Yeah, kickbox, jujitsu, stuff right. like that. You know, so, I mean, you're you're physically fit. You know, I'm, you know... 
I am, I, I am not. <laughs> you know, I'm just, uh, I'm right. a big, heavy set guy, you know? Okay. And uh, it's just uh, everything, everybody's different. Is it yeah. the same type of creature? I would say absolutely yes. Oh, okay, okay. It's, I just feel that it's either it's environment, mm -hmm. other factors made it look a little different. Okay. You know, you got a, a different diet, uh, mm -hmm. possibly, you know, uh, age factor. Right. Where this thing's maybe getting towards the end of its life, it's hungry, it's out out in the winter exposing itself in a semi-residential area mm -hmm. during somewhat daylight hours. It's taking a risk. Yeah. You know, it's, by walking it, across it is the true. road. Um, Kerry Arnold brought up the subject of, you know, do, he wonders, do these things get dementia just like humans do? Yeah. You know, and do they just get old and forgetful or just don't give a shit anymore? I would you know? say yes. I, I agreed. I said, yeah, sure. I don't see why that's not a possibility. Yeah, definitely. Definitely a um, very yeah, good possibility. Definitely, you know, it was, um, it was definitely eye-opening. I yeah. had a hard time after that, guys. I used to, that's... you know, I was very outdoorsy, and I, I used to go <clears> camp <throat> in the woods. My, friend, my friends and I would camp in the woods without a tent for days on end. Uh -huh. just go, we, you know, we might run home every other day or so to go grab a shower or something, but we'd always come back into the woods. You know, we had a campground way back in the woods, about uh, two miles from where I lived. Mm -hmm. And we would stay there in the summertime. And we actually had two campgrounds. One was called uh, Little Ben and the other one was called Big John. And the little one was the big one and the big one was the little one. So we, <laughs> we uh, you know, no tent, just... Sleeping bag on the ground, uh, you know, a plastic thing with some eggs in it, you know, and just have a blast. Eat hot dogs and eat chips by the fire at night, you know. And our parents, we were safe. We were totally safe from the, the surrounds of the entire world. We were on private land, you know, so there was no real worries of anything happening. Right. You know, so it was, it was an awesome way to grow up. But after that, man, it was not that easy I, I i had a hard time being out there by myself i i understand i we all do believe me believe me um yeah it, it's definitely a life-changing experience um john you got anything for him yeah how how old were you you said this happened in 79 right yeah i was 10 you were 10 oh you're the yeah, just 10 age 10. as me um yeah um and and like you said i was gonna ask how it affected you and <clears throat> how how you carried forward after seeing that because i you know i know it's it's tough man and i just had my sighting uh, a little over a year ago and oh, wow. it's, that's it got me it, it messed me up you know dude I'll, I'll, wait, when i tell you my second encounter we'll talk about messed up okay. I, I know what you mean man trust me um i afterwards you know i did now i do now i knew that these things existed yeah, they were. It was no longer a what if. The rest of the world was asking what if, and I didn't need to. That's tough I'm, for a ten-year-old kid, though. I mean, I'm you've got that on your time. shoulders, and you can't share it with anybody because you don't want the ridicule. Right. So that's that's kind of. I wanted to ask you about the psychology a little bit, like going to school and and did you tell a lot of people? Did you tell anybody? Not really, no, man. I didn't really talk about the subject until. Honestly, about three winters ago, yeah. uh, we, our power went out out here in Idaho, and my son and I were up in the middle of the night trying to keep the house warm, you know, and, you know, playing cards by candlelight. And he asked me if I ever saw anything weird at my, at, he calls it Grammy's place. Well, you guys understand that. Yeah. That was my yeah. mother's place. At, and he says, and I was like, yeah, you know, and I told him, I said, all kind of weird stuff happens around there, man. And Parker, my son, um, he proceeded to tell me about some things that just, uh, there was just something about the woods surrounding the home and that area that was, um, that just gave you a great uneasiness, especially, yeah. at, night, especially at night. And my son refers to it, he calls it the horror. <laughs> that's what you were he saying like, yeah he feels it like the entity he he feels there's something there right or, or there's just something in the air there and uh it is it's actually terrifying it's like one of those places you pull into at night you get out of your car and you run to the front door 
you know, <laughs> yeah. You, you, yeah. you don't walk, you run. You're you know, right. And, or you're going to work. I used to work night shift, you know. I'd run from the front door and, you know, run to my car. And, and we had all kind of lighting and stuff, which was cool. But, you know, my dad was really a stickler about using electric. Yeah. So I could like, turn all the lights on and then leave. Dear God in heaven, if you'd have come home and seen that, you know, <laughs> so I, I, I had to, you know, pretty much, but you know, anybody, anybody that used to hang out at my mom and dad's place will tell you that if something isn't right there. So I don't know if the, that's their, like, it's their sixth sense, you know, it's, you got to listen right. to your gut, you know, yeah, every now that, and then. Uh, uh, fight or flight kind of fear and state, it, you know, it's called him right. sense of impending doom. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, we, we uh we had uh it was it's all old Indian ground. So the I believe the Quamahoning Indian tribe originally were the people that lived there. Okay. Years ago, because we used to dig up their artifacts when we would garden or we would plow our farm there. We hmm. we dig up like old pieces of pottery and things right. like Native American uh, arrowheads and it's like. It's it's pretty cool. And uh, you know, but uh, in general, um, it I psychologically. I, 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 children's, children think about stuff differently. Yes. Children move on from tragedy a lot faster than adults. You know, when you're a kid, a week feels like two months. Right. A right. summer vacation feels like an eternity as a child. Yes, as it does. As an adult, summer vacation feels like a week. Mm-hmm. You know, right. Um, and, uh, shortly, you know, probably within, uh, you know, four or six weeks, that was okay. I, I, I kind of put it to the back of my mind and just went on with the rest of my school year. And, and, uh, I did everything I could to just keep living. And, and, but at the same time, I delved myself deeply into the subject. Yep. Uh, my mom, mom, take me to the library. My la- library was eight miles away. So my mom would say, okay, so should I, I'd go get books on the subject. It became an um, obsession. Yeah, of course. You know, mm-hmm. and there weren't that many books available. I right. believe it was only like maybe five or six between my school's library and the local library. There was probably only five or six books. Right. Uh, the one that sticks out the most was one called um, On the Track of Bigfoot by Marion Place. Uh, oh, that was probably we- the best one of the bunch. So, but for the most part, I, I studied it and I needed, wanted to know more about it. And I, of course I read, you know, a lot of people like, like I, I spoke to someone a few weeks ago who had never heard of the Bauman story. Really? Familiar with the Bauman story, the whole, like Teddy Roosevelt's. Uh, oh yeah. Related the story. Okay. Well, I spoke to someone that had never heard that. I mean, I read the, I read about the Bauman story when I was 11 years old. And this was someone that's into the subject? Yeah, someone they, well, someone someone that's a, a friend of mine here locally. Okay, okay. And they had never heard. That actually that that actually just happened not too far from here, about um 45 minutes from here. Oh, wow. So uh yeah, I you know, and and I I read it, I read up on it and studied it as much as I could. And of course, there were periods of my life where I honestly could could not have given a shit less. Right. You know, time right. moved on. I, you know, I, like I said, I, I was in Civil Air Patrol as a kid. I did six years as a Civil Air Patrol cadet, and then joined the Pennsylvania National Guard. So, you know, life moved on. Right. And I met, you know, I found out about girls and all that other fun stuff. You know, <laughs> as we all did. <laughs> Keg parties and four wheel drive trucks. You know, I found about all kind of cool stuff. Absolutely. And, as time went on, you know, <laughs> and uh, so that part of my life kind of fell away. Sure, you know, and uh, over time, you know, I would occasionally say someone would bring up the topic, and I'd just kind of shy back and say, "Well, I don't really know," you know, or just I'd rather I would just speak to them normally about the subject, and I would not relay the story. Or I would say, right. "Hey, I saw one of those things," you know. Right. Now, I didn't want. I still didn't want the flack years later. I get it. You yeah. Point in your life where you, where you get you, when you when you get so much so older, so much older, you you feel it. Uh, it's almost like a need. Like I have a need to relay this information. Yes, that, and then I know that's how we feel too. 
Yeah, it has to be out. This this information has to, has to be told. And That's you know, I'm education. tired of getting ridiculed. Yes, I'm me too. I'm tired of honest people who are hardworking, normal, everyday yep. folk from all walks of life who have these encounters that is mm-hmm. literally life altering. Mm-hmm. Sometimes to the point of causing mental illness. Absolutely. You know, yeah, I and, couldn't agree with you more, know, man. People scoff at them, laugh at them, or disregard them. It's it, it really makes me mad, but yep. I understand. What are you going to do? I mean, you, you can't prove it. There are people that still look at the Patterson Gimlin film and think it's a hoax. No, oh, God. You cannot get people to believe what they're not. If they're not going to believe it, they're not going to believe it. Yeah, there's some people you could throw a body in front of them and they're still going to. Right. They're not, you know, they're and, still and not going to believe it. The, the Patterson Gimlin film, to my, in my opinion, I did, the story behind the Patterson Gimlin film was about as shady as they come, but whatever's on that film is an actual living, breathing, walking creature. Absolutely. That we just haven't been able to identify yet. Yep. And For that sure. can actually lead me into my personally, my second encounter. Oh, nice. Because the creature I saw here in Idaho was of that type of, of being. It was okay. Very, built very similarly to what they call the patty creature. Okay. So you want to lead us, um, tell us about head, leading, like, uh, as far as what was going on leading up to that event and go from there? Sure. Um, let me think. So, like I said, I moved, I retired out here. I moved out here. And I met a girl. Okay. Uh, she was a singer in a band. Uh, she was singing down in Moscow, Idaho one night. And I just, you know, we started a conversation. Conversation led to phone calls, uh, emails, uh, dating. And then we ended up moving in together. And so uh, it was the following summer, uh, the summer of 2011, um, my my girlfriend and I decided we were going to do a camping slash river floating trip. Mm-hmm. Uh, river floating is hugely popular out here. Um, just people like, uh, you know, an inner tube, a cooler of beer, and that's it. Yeah. You get in and float down the river or get drunk. And uh, it's hugely popular um, because we're so, we're surrounded by colleges. We have Gonzaga University, um, Montana uh, State, um, um, University of Missoula, uh, and uh, what else? Uh, Lewis and Clark. Uh, we have a college here, North Idaho College. Um, so, uh, Washington State. So, the area I'm in is a huge tourist area. You know, it's huge with the mountains and rivers and lakes and all that. Right. And it's hugely popular for everybody to come up here and go camping. And we have vast national forests. Uh, we have the uh, Idaho Panhandle National Forest, the Coeur d'Alene National Forest, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I could go on. You know, Google it, get a map. If you look at North Idaho, it's just all woods. So, yeah, it's all, all wild. You know, yeah. And um, we, we uh, had planned this trip to include my best friend, who's a professor at Washington State, and okay. his wife, and then my girlfriend's sister and her husband, and we had, uh, my, my girlfriend had two dogs. Uh, she had a, a pug, a one-eyed pug. It was the cutest <laughs> dog in the world. He was really a loving creature. And, uh, and then we, she had a, a border collie. And uh, the border collie was, I don't know if you guys are familiar with those dogs or not, but man. Very well, yeah. Everybody, every, you know, that's a very, if you're a very fortunate person, if you can own one of those, because they are really smart, amazing creatures. And uh, so we went up. It was going to be a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, come home Saturday trip. Um, we went up on a Wednesday because we were already off on vacation. I was semi-retired. I only worked three days a week at the time anyway. But um, she was working full-time. Uh, she drove a loader for our local landfill. And uh, she did the singer in the band thing part-time. So she was like a heavy equipment operator, truck driver. Okay. And we went up to uh, we went up to what's called the uh, Coeur d'Alene National Forest, uh, kind of a sub area called Bumblebee. Okay. 
Uh, Bumblebee is, uh, if you look it up online, it's you'll see what I mean about the, uh, the recreation area. And uh, Bumblebee is a campground and recreation area along the North Fork of the Coeur d'Alene River. And it's a beautiful river, uh, winds through a canyon um, for miles and miles and miles. <clears throat> and then it meets up with the, the rest of the Coeur d'Alene River and then flows into Lake Coeur d'Alene which once it empties out the other side, turns into the Spokane, the Spokane River. Okay. So um, we, we found a beautiful campsite. Um, they're totally free, by the way. Um, you just have to be first come, first serve. Right. And we set up some camp on Wednesday and because we, we, we thought we'd just go up, she and I, hang out, you know, relax, have, have some us time, you know what I mean? You know, yeah. Rather than, having everybody around. Right. So we went up and we got, I, I spent the afternoon putting up tents. Uh, I set up four tents and a dining canopy and then um, like a regular tarp to cover the, the eating, or not the, the eating table, the cooking table and the camp stove and all that. And we had a uh, screened in dining canopy and uh, uh, I said, again, four tents. There was one tent for everybody plus a spare. And, uh, we did all that. We took a walk and ex- explored around. I sent you a couple of photos the other day. One of them was uh, me standing on that big log. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Literally, that th- this event happened feet away from that. Okay. So, so um, we we uh, we didn't bring any food with us because we were going to go shopping the next day with everybody. Once everybody got there on Thursday, we were all going to go about twenty miles up the road to a place called um, uh, what's the name of that town? Smeltersville, Idaho. Okay. Uh, there's, a, there's a Walmart there. Believe it or not, it's all, literally, there's, I swear there's a Walmart on the backside of the sun. This proves it because this place is just literally in the middle of nowhere and there's a Walmart there. And uh, we, we were, so we were going to go stock up and do all our can. And all, so we do like a meal prep thing, you know, like everybody else, what are we going to do Thursday night? What do you want for dinner Friday night? You know? And so I brought a couple nice big steaks up and a couple beautiful prime ribeyes. And um, my girlfriend brought some oysters on the shell, and we had a cooler that had some other stuff in it, some hot dogs and just other stuff just in case, stuff for the dogs. And uh, we made dinner. We set up, we made dinner, I cooked the steaks, and we we did the oysters. And and, uh, then we were just kind of settling down for the evening. we had a couple chairs set up by the fire, and it was just starting to get dark. It was getting to dark where it was where you don't want to walk into the woods now. You have to have a flashlight. It's, it's a little brighter outside of the woods, but in the forest is is pitch black. You know. Yeah. So we we were sitting there by the fire. Um, I was looking forward to just hanging out in the evening and, you know, maybe drinking a few beers and enjoying it. And I, I was actually drinking a Mountain Dew at the time. And uh, we were just chilling out. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, our dogs just charged off into the woods, just bolted. I mean, they didn't bark or yip or anything. They did not give any indication that they were going to... um take off or they were alarmed wow and the first thing it did was shock me because dogs don't do that usually they, they yip and then they take off right you know, they'll bark a few times and then they'll run like if they see somebody walking through the woods that doesn't belong there they'll bark then go or they'll just stay there and bark depending these dogs just depending you you know, and that was kind of unusual for both of them to do that. And I got kind of upset, and my girlfriend was upset. She's like, oh, geez, what are we going to do? we got to go hunt after these dogs now, you know? So I went to the cab of my truck, and I got my uh, mag light. I had a three-cell LED mag light. And I went back to we were getting ready to walk in the woods to go find the dogs, and the dogs... Mm-hmm. Right at that time, from the time it took me to run back to the go to the truck to get the flashlight and come back to the camps to the to the, beside the fire, which is only you know 30, 40 feet. I the dogs came 
flying out of the woods, just at a full tilt. And they ran from my truck. I had a full-size Chevy with a cap on the back. And the the border collie just sailed up, jumped, sailed right into the bed of the truck and went all the way to the back corner, turned around and stared into the woods. The pug come chugging after her. He tried to jump up on the tailgate, but couldn't. <laughs> he jumped up. He jumped up and slammed into the back bumper. I felt so bad for him. Oh, anyway, so guy. we got him all scooped up and we put him in the bed of the truck. And he scooted to the back right, and I thought he was going to try to dig through her. He was. He went underneath. He got underneath her, and they both turned around and just stared, dead stare into the woods. So he was pretty freaked uh, out. Yeah, and me and my girlfriend are like, "What the." Is, you know, what is going on here? You know? And I'm like, oh my, we must have a bear. Or at first, the first thing that hit my head was a panther. Right, which would make, that makes sense, yeah. Uh, see, I, I say the word panther. Uh, you guys are Eastern, and mostly the word panther is common. This yeah. is out here, they're mountain lions or pumas or cougars for the most yeah, part. That's, uh, we refer to them to as cougars in the Adirondacks, yeah. yeah they're, they're all pretty much the same creature. Same thing, yeah. So, um, we, uh, so I went into the cab of my truck, and I had a, a, a Smith & Wesson Model mm-hmm. 29, you know, and I, I, it was in the console. And I only had one cylinder full. I didn't have any spare bullets with me. I just had right. a gun as well as Idaho, and you don't have to have a permit here for guns and stuff, so you can just drive around and do whatever you want to do. And uh, I... I uh, grabbed it out and I tucked it in my belt and I go with the mm-hmm. flashlight. Come on, let's go and see what's going on. We must have a cat. And I'm not afraid of mountain lions. I know I probably should be, but I'm a big dude. I would probably get hurt, but I think I could fend off a mountain lion. Yeah, it's usually smaller women you hear about them going after. Yeah, I, I, I mean, and I was trying to protect her. Sure. And I was like, all right, let's go look and see if we can see anything. Go throw some logs on the fire, please. I asked her, so she went over, she chucked me four or five logs on the fire. And I got over there and I started looking through the woods with the flashlight. I'm holding the flashlight in my hand um, beside my head. You know, I have the, the head of the flashlight is in my hand and the back of the flashlight is going back behind my head. Right. And I call it like cop style. Yeah. You know. And I'm holding it, and I'm going through the woods, just scanning through. I didn't really see anything. And then I turned the light off. I turned around to her and, and talked to her for a second. And we were, she was digging around the fire, you know, getting it right now. The fire was really roaring at this point. So I, I turned back around, and I hit the light again. And I started sweeping through the woods from left to right, or I'm sorry, from right to left. And I probably didn't move the flashlight beam five feet. And I saw behind a tree about 30 feet away from me, there were two giant trees. Um, There are big giant pine trees. And behind the furthest one was a Sasquatch standing there. Um, He was mostly occluded by the tree. Mm -hmm. Uh, About half of him or more was hanging out to the side. He was kind of like leaned out, you know. He wasn't standing beside the tree. He was behind the tree, leaning out from it. Okay, and, that's uh, not the picture you sent me, is it? No, no, okay. that's not my picture. That's somebody else. That was okay. Picture. Okay, my bad, my bad. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that picture, I that was a pretty good uh, pareidolia one. Yeah, very good. Yeah, see, that was <laughs> that. That was a good picture. Yeah. So, like here, okay, here's some leaves. What do you see? Yeah, uh, you know, that you're like, oh, okay, there is actually something in that tree. It's a shame it's so out of focus, but still, so, anyway, you can tell. <laughs> yeah, you can. Tell. Anyway, but this thing's leaning out from this tree. It's easily eight to nine feet tall. If it's standing in the creek, it's nine feet tall. If it's standing on the ground, it's eight feet tall. This tree was right against the edge of the creek, where the creek made a corner. It's actually called the, this area of the North Fork is called Canyon Creek. And I, we were talking the other day, and I tell you how they name the creek. They name rivers and in, in, in sections by yeah. like this creek, that TP Creek, Canyon Creek, Gimlet Creek, you know, just to delineate where you are on the river. 
And uh, so well, the area I'm in was called Canyon Creek. And the water was right, this is where the creek came down and made an abrupt right-hand turn, and there was a big, huge log jam piled up there. Okay. Uh, the creek is only about 15, 20 feet wide at this point of the, of the year. Right. And um, it's uh, only probably about, you know, depending on depth in, in, in this area, it's only maybe 12 inches to uh, two feet deep. And um, so this is the water, the, the, the tree was right at the edge where the water made an abrupt right-hand turn and then eroded away. So there was like a foot drop from the, the ground down into the creek. So like I said, eight feet, nine feet, depending on whether it was standing on the ground or not. If it was standing on the ground, it was eight feet. Right. At least. At least. And if it was standing in the water, it was nine feet at least. That's um, I it's didn't get the eye shine off of it, but all I did was I just kept my beam moving. When I moved the flashlight across it, I was like, holy mother of God. You know? <laughs> and I just kept the beam moving. I moved the beam about 10, 20 feet to its left, turned it off. And I backed away from the woods. And I said, Allie, there's something in the woods. Hey, by and something, you, you, knew, you knew what it was. I knew exactly what it was. Yeah. And, and I was like, um, we need to get back from the woods a little bit. And she's like, oh, my God. And she's freaking out. She's worried about her dogs. We finally had the dogs calm down. They were actually moved into one of the spare tents. <laughs> and they were chilling out in there for a little bit. And... All right, so as I was telling you the other day, um, kind of knowledgeable about these things. I'm not totally unfamiliar. A, I've seen one before. Mm -hmm. B, um, I've been reading about them my whole life. Yeah. So I stopped. I, this is just a pause in the conversation here. That's okay. A description, like I said, eight to nine feet tall, pitch black, shiny black fur that looked almost like it had been brimmed, like combed. And like, um, yeah, like, like, like kind of like a black horse yep. or like a black bear that had been, Groove. you know, taken care of. Yeah. Um, and it was enormously broad at the chest. It yep. had not very much of a head at all. Its head was just a slight bump that stuck above its shoulders uh, or shoulder. I only saw right. one shoulder. And the one arm, the arm that was hanging down was brought so, somewhat across its body. So it was either holding on to this tree from the other side or it mm -hmm. was just standing there doing a tree peak. Right, right. When that song. I didn't see any like facial features really or anything like that. I was that beam only cut across it for a second. Yeah, yeah. And I, I um, and it was enormous. Absolutely enormous. It had to be five feet wide. That's a big that's that's big. I went, yeah. uh, me and Igor, Igor Bertsev came out here two summers ago. He spent a week with me. Yep. And I took him up to the site and we did some, you know, recon of the area and some, you know, measurements and stuff. And yeah, this thing was easily five feet wide. That's, that's a big so, one. So, um, back the way, and this is when I was, this is when I became a little frightened because I didn't, I've never seen anything this big before. Sure. You know, this was something totally, you know, that's like, well, people have asked you, well, why didn't you shoot it? Uh, uh, because I, what I, I might as well just throw sand at it for what right. I had. I had a 44 Magnum. I would yeah, run out of this that, that wouldn't have been enough. I hear you. Um, there were about three things I would have used, a 308, an aught 6, or maybe uh, a 12-gauge slug. Right. But uh, those, other than that, I would not even have attempted and I wouldn't yeah. even have attempted it if I would have had either of those three. Yeah, I get you. But if you came to defending way. yourself, it'd be another story. Yeah. I understand. Yeah, and there was no, there was no way I would, because hey, I'm not like that. I'm not. I know it's yeah. a big thing. It's not hurting me. I'm not going to hurt it unless right. it tries to hurt. Me. Sure. So what we, I just, I just let's back away. Let's keep the fire going. Let's try to relax. I mean, maybe it'll just go away. It'll go off on its own. Mm-hmm. And I still hadn't told her what it was. She was pretty much still under the impression that we had a mountain lion. Right. So I'm like, all right, we'll just leave it at that for now. And <laughs> hey. I, I said, so we sat down back by the fire and chilled out. And um, I'm 
the fire is huge now, so we had to move our chairs back a few feet. And I'm sitting, we're sitting there, and we're about three feet apart. And all of a sudden, you know, well, I had already shouted at it. I'm sorry, I, I missed the part where I told whoever's in the woods, please don't mess with us. I'm armed. I will defend myself because I was just, I didn't know what else to do. I don't speak Sasquatch. So I got to <laughs> say right. something. So, you know, right. I, I shouted at it and tried to startle it. And, uh, you know, so I'm like, all right, that's fine. We'll, we'll see what we can do. We'll sit down and relax. So we're sitting there like three, four minutes. And out of the woods comes tumbling this giant rock. <laughs> it's about five. I have the rock. I kept it. It's eight inches long and five inches wide. It's a kind of egg-shaped, like a uh -huh. river rock. It's right. a round river rock. It comes tumbling out of the woods. And it grazes right across. It goes in between she and I, like we're a goalpost. And it goes right across the top of the fire. And it kicks sparks everywhere. Wow. On the top of the fire. Sparks go flying. Uh, logs go flying. Um, I, 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 it startled me. I jumped up. Uh, I took um, the, there were sparks and coals, hot coals all over our dining canopy. And all over our shoes and everything, you know. So I, I was trying to get my yeah. mountain dew out of my, out of my, you know, the, the collapsible folding camp chairs, how they have those little stupid cup holders. Yeah. And my, my mountain dew was in a foamy, so I couldn't get it out. So I just ended up turning the whole chair over and just dumping the mountain dew on the side of the dining canopy to try to get these sparks out. And, and that was it. I threw the chair down. I pulled that forty, that forty-four out, and I pointed it into the woods at an upright angle, probably about forty-five degrees. And I squeezed off two rounds. And I was like, "All right, great. Now I have four bullets." Why did <laughs> I do that? For that, right? Why, why that? As soon as I did it, I regretted it. I was like, "Well, I should have just shot once. Why did I shoot twice?" And my ears are ringing. The dogs are freaking out. The the you know, there's the hot coals all over the ground. And I had just had it. I had just had it with this thing. And it moved. It took off. It started running to the left. It moved about uh, 40, 45 feet to the left. And it made a loud snapping sound, which I later discovered. I thought it was a branch of a tree, but it wasn't. It was actual a tree. It was a uh, one of those double pines. It grabbed yeah. one of those double pines and just snapped it right off. About yeah. halfway up. And it made it, and that that pop, that wood pop, was very loud and startling. And I'm shouting into the woods, and Allie's like, "Who are you shouting out? Who are you shouting out?" And I pretty much told her, "I says, I think we have a Sasquatch." And she's like, "Well, oh, well." She's like, "At this point, she actually looks at me. She says, well, no kidding." I'm like, <laughs> why, didn't you, "Why didn't you say something earlier? You know, here I am trying to protect you, trying to keep you from being scared. And meanwhile, you know, but she's from Idaho. She's." She's like I said. She was a, a she was a construction worker, man. She drove bulldozer and um, <laughs> and stuff. You know, she didn't. None of this really faced her. Yeah. To the point where I thought it did. Yeah. And she was still afraid, and she still crawled in her tent with a knife. You know, with the dogs, and it was cowered in there after this all happened. Right. And after the, after then, and then it took off. It ran. It came back to the right. And when it came back to the right, it splashed in the river twice. And when splash, splash, tore ass across the other side and went up the hill. We could hear it breaking branches for wow. minutes. For minutes after um, the whole thing, it, it like it didn't care anymore. It didn't care if it was it hurt did, or seen. Yeah, it, at that point, it didn't give a shit. It. And, up, and it, it, you could hear it going up the hillside for minutes afterwards. And uh, and I'm like, at that point, I'm like, all right, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> we're done i grabbed as much crap as i could i grabbed our coolers i grabbed our uh radio i grabbed our camp stove and uh threw it in the bed of the truck gathered up the dogs put the fire out with our drinking water and as we were loading up the rest of the crap into the truck that was horrifying man when it went pitch black like that mm -hmm. and the fire went out because a fire gives a human being great security yes it does but once yes, there's no fire and not only is there no fire, now you have a giant steam cloud. Yeah. And it, it's, it was very frightening. Very, very frightening. 
Mm -hmm. We got we just loaded up our important stuff and tore ass out of there. I don't blame you. It took about forty five minutes to get home. Uh, we really didn't talk about it much on the way home. And I told her the next morning when we woke up, I was like, "Yeah, hey, whatever happened last night, we got to go back up there and get our stuff." <laughs> what do you well, think about that? She's like, "Well, yeah." So we went back up, but this time I took my twelve gauge with me, and Good uh, choice. just yep. in case, just in case. And uh, I have a, just it's a regular, it's an eight seventy, you know, the standard twelve gauge pump shotgun. Sure. And uh, I went up with uh, that, and I had my pistol with me. And yeah. I have a big old Marine Corps K bar, and yeah. I was I went you know prepared this time. Well, we went up, we gathered up our stuff. I looked around a little bit. I found that tree in the woods because I wanted to see if there was any prints. That's what I wanted to see. Right, but there were none because it was like rocky, uh, real packed down because it was a campground, you know, and that earth yeah. on campgrounds gets packed. Yeah, from sure. kids and families and dogs and everybody running all over it all summer long. So there was no footprints, but I found the tree that it snapped. It was about five, six inches in diameter, and it was a nice big pine tree. It just snapped it right clean, like at a 90-degree angle. And uh, I think that's some kind of show of force for them. You know, that's like, yes. hey, this is what I can do to your neck. No, I, I agree. It, it's trying to show – it's a dominate, uh, the dominance yeah. thing. It's, yeah, it's trying to show its dominance. And um, it uh, – and then, so, and then I got that rock that it had thrown through the fire. And it was laying against the dining canopy there. I grabbed it and threw it. I said, this is my Bigfoot rock. This is the night I battled Bigfoot. <laughs> and I took That's it. cool. I That's it, cool you catch that. I That's still cool. have it. It's right out in front of my house in my rock garden, dude. That's so, awesome. That's awesome. You know, and uh, I know that was a condensed version. That whole time. No, that took, that, that whole thing that's took okay. about 45 minutes. No, that's all right. Um, Sean, you got anything you want to ask him? Or? It was about a 45 minutes event from start to finish. So all together, they, they, yeah, I see what you're saying. Wow. That's a, that's actually a long, you know. From, from when the dog break. bolted into the woods till we bustled out of there was about 45 minutes. So. Which is, as far as an encounter goes, that's an extremely long time to deal with something like that. Well, like I said, I... I kind of thought it would run away. I thought it would not run away, but I thought yeah. it would just ramble off. Because I knew right. it wasn't going to, because it was going to attack our campsite or eat my dogs. My dogs would be eaten and our campsite would already be trashed. I, yeah, knew it yeah. be I didn't get that vibe. I didn't get that, um, I didn't get that uh, terror until it threw the mm -hmm. rock. And then really, even after it threw the rock, I wasn't that afraid. You know, yeah. I was like freaked out, you know, to the point where, I, you know, Jesus, thing is really starting to mess with me now. What, what, you know, is it going to escalate any more rocks? I figured if any more rocks come, that's it. Forget the tents, forget the dogs. I'm out. You know, right. I'm grabbing, I, I don't I'm grabbing blame her you. by the hand and we are gone. You know, I don't blame but you. It, it didn't chuck any more rocks at me. And in all honesty, I don't know. I don't know how many of them there were. There could have been just one. I think there was just one. But everybody I always tell the story to is that, oh, there was probably six or eight of them there. I'm like, eh, I don't think so. I no, think I don't know about that. that. Maybe maybe I one more, know. but as far as six or eight, eh, I don't think. I don't know. This was a big <laughs> bull who smelled our steaks cooking and smelled That's our exactly cooking. what it was. Yep. And it, smelled, it found the dogs, and the dogs ran into the woods, and the dogs saw something they had never encountered or never saw before. Yep. Scared the shit out of them. They ran sure. back. And they had you know, never encountered a creature like that, so they didn't know how to react other than with fear. Right. And, uh, you know, I've I've I'm actually kind of proud of myself because I didn't like running into the woods like blasts and you know, <laughs> or, you know, right. or, or or just try to try to take it or try to shoot it in general. Right. Because there's nothing I could have done. Nothing, honestly, nothing that would have stopped this this creature. No. I mean, I you know I. <laughs> Short of a, a 458 or uh, a, a 50 caliber, and even those, even those travel at such high velocity. I, honestly, I just can't imagine it knocking it down. Yeah, I, I gotta agree with you on that. Uh, you know, one of my sightings, I told you, I think I told you on the phone, I had my 300 Weatherby mag on me, and I think if I had used it on her, I don't, I, I still don't think that would have been enough. To be honest with you, 
because well, we wouldn't be having any conversation right now. What's that? We wouldn't, we wouldn't be talking right now, had you? Exa- ex- exactly. Just how close she was. It, it, the round, no matter what the round, I was using nozzle partitions. It would have passed right through her no matter what because we were so close together and we wouldn't be talking. Yeah. So you you would yeah. be part of their you would be part of their living room furniture right now. Absolutely, absolutely. So <laughs> now, so guys, if, to take one out. if you you know, good luck trying to shoot one. Yeah, because there's five or six of them that are not going to let you come out of the woods. That's right. Absolutely right. We just had two guys uh, two years ago, two summers ago. We had two guys that were out here actively hunting. Mm-hmm. Um, one of them was from. Uh, Montana. I want, to say the, I want to say the other one was from Oregon, but they were up in the woods with like all kind of high tech equipment, like radios, and they had uh, like um, uh, motion sensing equipment and all kind of stuff set up. Yeah, and um, they never came out of the woods. Wow! So, you, know, you you didn't actually hear about that thing on the four on the missing four on one or anything? No, not really. That's now that's interesting right there. Well, no, they, no, no. no sign of him or anything, Joe. This could be like who knows? This uh, dude, this is the American West. Hunters go missing here all yes, the time. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. That's all I'm gonna say about it. Yep, but these they guys do. were up there supposedly act- actively hunting Sasquatch. Now, whether this is true, I do not know. This happened right. in Montana, you know, but well, they never, they, I know they did recover their vehicle. And uh, I haven't honestly really followed up with a story. I should probably do that. So yeah, that that's interesting. Uh, I know it have where Jr. and I are in North Carolina. I mean, it happens in the Appalachians all the time. These hundred, these people end up disappearing. You know. Uh, uh, yeah, my uh, the, uh, the, the, the they find these guys uh, years later. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, you know hunter, it, usually it's another hunter that will find them. It's bizarre. Uh, a lot of people. Here, here's a good example. Um, between Spokane, Washington, and Seattle, mm-hmm. um, there are 90 aircraft that are gone. Yeah, I've heard that before. Gone. They have never and they can't found. find them, right? They can't find them. Yeah. Here, and it's only an hour flight. Yeah. You know, that's, that's it's interesting. Like a three, it's a four hour drive from Spokane yeah. to Seattle. Yeah, that's interesting. There are 90 aircraft on the ground that we cannot find. Now, how are you going to find something that doesn't want to be found if you can't find something that fell out of the sky? Exactly. Exactly. Something that intelligent. If they want to stay hidden, they're going to stay hidden. And that's what people don't get. Yeah, man, that's a good point. You know? um, They don't want to be found. Good luck. Yeah, good. Exactly. I think it's all, you know, the three of us have discussed it several times. You know, the best. Best way to go about it, if you're a researcher, in our opinion, is not to go out there and beat on trees and and do your and boop and all that crap. I mean, act like you're minding your own business. Uh, like you said, your that encounter you had, you guys were camping. Yeah, we thing were, came, was thing came in to check you out. Came in to check but, you out. I've, I've often told a lot of folks, you know, if you ever come out this way, um, I have a five bedroom home. Um, more than welcome to stay. That this would be is only phenomenal. Half an hour from here, forty-five minutes, half hour away, and would... um, you know, it's just so you have to see it to understand it. It's a canyon. I've got pictures that you sent me that uh, I'll share with these guys after. I haven't quite figured out how to share to the system yet, but uh, I will show these guys these pictures you sent me. As far as where the where you get your, you set up your camp, yeah, stuff, and you it's know, pretty wild. It's like the the, the the hills, the hillsides on each side are almost vertical. It's unreal, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And how so, that thing made it up like that, like the way you described, is just out of this world. Yeah, it, it's very inhospitable. Um, at the, the bottom of the canyon, it's beautiful. There's it's flat. There's the creek bed runs through there. There's pastoral little clearings, right, and uh, beautiful little uh, fishing spots, and camping areas, and hunting areas, and jeep trails, and all kind of great stuff. But if you go out away from the bottom of the canyon, mm-hmm. it's straight up on both sides. 
Right. So anything could live up there. Sure. We don't know. You know, and we don't know what's out there in the woods. We really don't, in all reality. You know. The guy had a sighting back in 91 at the exact same spot. Um, uh, oh, really? Some of his friends were uh, going river floating. And uh, he, uh, they were putting their floats in the river, and somebody was throwing rocks at them. And he was like, what the hell? You know, who's throwing rocks? So he walks away from the group and goes back up to his car. And he's like pretending to look around and he's getting in the trunk of his car to, you know, mm -hmm. show of it or whatever to see right. if there's anybody up there. He saw nobody. And then while he's closing the trunk of his car out of the corner of his eye to the left, he looks and a Sasquatch walks across the road right towards the, um, or it would be from his right to his left. Did he get a good uh, visual on it, or oh, any description wise? About nine feet tall, pitch black. Wow. So I don't know. Is this my same rock throwing buddy? Could could be. <laughs> I call it. I named him Bumblebee Bob. By the way, I think <laughs> she said something about that. You know, and I, let me let me back up a little bit. Uh, you know how you said you it looked like he'd been groomed. Yes. Um, you know that's interesting because we get a lot of reports about. Uh, these things being all matted up and all that but what I've seen and you know my wife had her first encounter in 2016 and what we've seen in the Adirondacks I can describe as similar they look like they have been groomed they're very clean very clean looking yeah, like and, almost like a chimpanzee How right a chimpanzee? or a gorilla or whatever yeah but I, I just not to get off the subject but I just thought that was interesting you mentioned that yeah, I was shocked uh, for the brief second that I saw it. Right. Or to understand what it was like to see it. And like I said, like I said, it was like almost shiny, like a like a black horse or a black bear. Right. And very, you know, the hair was very well organized. It wasn't like all leaves and sticks and twigs or nothing hanging out. Of it. Yeah. Right. So whatever you know, what whatever type of hair material it has, it must be able to you know not get too matted up this right right have, i wouldn't say this thing had long hair across its shoulders you know it seemed to have more hair okay. it was like hairier at the top of the chest than at the bottom right but, um, you know its arms were pretty well hair covered so yeah i wish i would have got a better look at it i mean but at the same time I, i'm glad i didn't yeah, I can relate. So, I after all this happened, um, I started having nightmares. Uh, I was having trouble staying focused at work. So, I went to a doctor, and, you know, what do you say to a doctor whenever? <laughs> you know, oh, I, I know. I, I don't mean to laugh, Joe, but I, 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 I know what you're saying. You know, yeah. what, do we, what do I say? Oh, hey, you know, I saw a Bigfoot, and now I can't sleep. Right. So I just went to the doctor and told her that I'm having trouble sleeping, that I'm suffering from anxiety. I'm uh -huh. a nurse after all. I've been a nurse for 30 years. Sure. You know, and I'm like, all right. Um, so I got out of van. I had to take out of van for six months afterwards. Well, we both, we, you should, we shared that, you know, I shared some info with you regarding that the other night as well. If you uh, recall. Yes. You know, it, it's disturbing. You know, I mean, in like like you said, what do you say to these people? Hey, I saw a big fly. I need some, uh, you know, right. I need someone to help me sleep. You know, <laughs> I mean, no, I didn't say that. You know, and then once again, exactly. Once no, again, no shame uh, in that, Joe. I had to take Joe Xanax for a couple of weeks. Up. She, we ended up breaking up and going our separate ways. <clears throat> so I, you know, and you're right, Sean. There is no shame about, in it. I, I didn't talk about it much afterwards. Again, I kept my mouth shut about it really didn't start talking about it until about three years ago. Like I said, that night the power went out. Right. I didn't right. pour my guts out. So. I, I'll tell you what, my first experience ruined my hunting for about two years. Yeah, I haven't been camping since. So. Really? You know, I've been like to my friend's campground. <laughs> you know, she has like a lakeside uh, little yeah. bush camper in the summertime. Yeah. Uh, I've been there, but I haven't been in the woods. I haven't been right. in the woods camping a lot like this. I really don't even want to go back. Yeah. You know, like, we, yeah, the three of us have talked about, you know, whether we see, yeah, I hear, in a way, you know, you want to get another visual, but in a way, you don't, because there, it's just such a disturbing freaking sight. You know, I mean, 
Um, I know uh, my two colleagues here are dying to ask you a question. Far away. John, you want to go ahead, or JR, you want to go ahead with it? Go ahead, about, the, about the rock. I was actually a little bit curious about your girlfriend. I, I understand uh, how how you're dealing with it, but um, she was she a believer before? Is she a believer now, or was she skeptical? Or? Um, she is a believer to the extent that she is from Idaho and knows that these things exist. Right. And, um, and uh, but she's never actually seen one. Okay. Yeah, right, right, right. That was her stance on it. Right, yeah, right. There's, 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 there's believers and there's knowers, and I think we're all knowers. We're all knowers, yeah, right, right. Without, without a doubt. And, and she grew up in a town called St. Mary's, which is um, a huge lumber timber town. Okay. So I'm just going to go ahead and let you guys think about what that would be like, what the, the things these guys have probably seen through the years, and the stories that could float around a town like that, you know. Oh, yeah, I mean, way back, I, way back I, in the middle of nowhere, you know, yeah. it's, it's an hour from here, and it's literally, there's nothing else around it. It's its own standalone community way down at the southern end of Lake Coeur d'Alene, so. Right. There's, uh, and there's a lot of history of it. They have a big, they have a big Paul Bunyan festival down there and every year, <laughs> so it's a, it's a timber community, and, sure. you know, timber communities and they always have the guys with the stories and people and people that have had encounters. Right. Um, and she had known some people that have had encounters through the years, but this was the first time she ever had anything like this happen. And no, she did not see the creature. So. Right. But she you. could tell by the way her dogs were acting that there's something wasn't right. So, well, right. yeah. And the bears don't throw rocks and nothing, no, nothing else is going to roll rocks. that rock in it. So. So do you, it was the most, like, the most strangest thing. I can still see that rock before you coming through the air. It would, it like tumbled like a it had a backspin to it. Yeah, well, yeah, yep. it was like it was tumbled, like it was thrown underhand. You know? Yep, yep. Do you yeah. think it was trying to throw the rock at you guys? Like, like do you think it was like, like seriously trying to hit you guys? Or I, no, I don't think so. I think if it wanted to hit me, it would have come straight out of the woods. I think right. I probably would have chucked it overhand or side. Aside from that, they're very proficient with the rock throwing. Trying to tell us something about that fire. It didn't like the light. It didn't like the bright mm -hmm. light coming off of it. It was. It. It, it just. It, maybe did it try to hit the fire on purpose? Maybe, but I just think it was just trying to scare us, warn us, get the hell uh, out. I think it was trying to mess with us more than anything. Because right. it never threw anything else, you know. Mm -hmm. And. Um, other than it, the only the only real show of force it did, other than throwing the rock out, was breaking that tree. Right. Yeah. Which you know, I like we were saying. I think that's a dominance thing. I, hey, yeah. saying I'm the man. You know. If right. you guys would have stuck around, something bad might have happened. Though it was probably I agree. Really smart. Um, you know, it just really smart that you got out of there. Um, like when we came back the next day, uh, nothing was touched. It was the only the only the only trashing that happened to the campsite was the trashing I did the night before. Right. Yeah, I think it was just telling you to leave, and you left, and he yeah. was happy. So there you go. Yeah, we left. yeah you know, but the, it was kind of weird because they had to call. You know, I had to call my friend up and say, "Hey, we had to cancel our trip." <laughs> you know, and we had to call her sister up, and it was no big deal for her sister. Her sister just lived in the same town with us. But uh, my friend lives down in Tri Cities, which is um, uh, Pasco, Richland, and Kennewick, which is down in south southern Washington, and it's right. a three-hour drive. So it was sure. kind of a big deal for him. He was on vacation too, you know. So they were so going to come and join you guys, right? But we okay. we ended up just doing something. We all they did end up everybody. We all got together, but we just went to a different campground that was more peopled. Right, right. Here, I don't blame. Um, I don't blame. An area it. called Twin Lakes, which is like um, kind of a ritzy, rich, upscale kind of camping area, you know. So, yeah, a lot of Californians and stuff. So. Right, did you, right. Did you yeah. sleep? Did you sleep any of the time that you were camping? No, man. <laughs> <laughs> I never even got in my sleeping bag, dude. I never. <laughs> you know, we put the tents up, and that was it. Yeah. <laughs> I never even got to do anything. She, I never even went in the tent. She was the one. She was the one setting everything up. 
you know. I mean, after you switched campsites, did you still sleep? The, oh, after yeah, okay, yeah. When we went to the other campsite, yeah, I did because I was drunk. No, yeah, right. On, that's what I was doing. Yeah. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna you know, I, you know, about ten or twelve beers and a half bottle of Jack. You're gonna fall. Asleep. <laughs> so that's true. But that's you know, we pretty much rushed. And we told them that there was a bear. They had. Uh, we we pretty much just told them that there was uh, bear activity up there. And, yeah, and that shut everybody up, and they didn't even ask again, and we didn't tell. You're right. You know what? What she's told her sister since I don't know, but I've never told my friend. I've never told Chris what happened. Yeah, I really hope the day comes soon that we can not have to worry about that kind of stuff. I Me mean, too. Me the, too. The more and more, I think the more and more people start sharing their experiences like this, um, you know, it, it, it's going to be less taboo. I hope so. You know, and that's the reason we do it, Joe, uh, Jr., Sean, and myself. We do this to educate people, and you know, and people need to know. Like you were saying, we talked about that on the phone last week. People need to know. You know, it, yeah, these I, things. I think are, that's it. The, the key. The key real. To get the word out. We we need and we need to somehow stop whatever conspiratorial forces are working against. The I the I agree with you there. To keep the subject so squashed. Yep. Um, in every aspect. I mean, you ever watch the news stories they do about it? Those yeah, oh yeah. Prick, those prick broadcasters and reporters always got to chuckle. They got always, chuckle. always, every single always. time. It makes me sick. You know, you tell you, yeah, I'd like for them to have a face-to-face with one of them. Exactly. I want, I want to jump to the TV and say, okay, come with me. Exactly. You know, that's funny. I was just talking to my girlfriend about that two nights ago, and I and I told her, we were talking about how I do this show and how I'm into this, and she's still not really on board with any of it. She doesn't believe, but and I told her, I said, you know, I mean, even if we had a body on a table, they'd find a way to skirt it. And I said, and, and, sure. and I told her about the footprints I found recently and the stuff I've seen. And, and she's like, well, why don't you tell somebody around here about it? Because, and I told her, I said that the news might do a little clip on it and then they would laugh about it. And laugh about it. And make me look like an asshole. And yeah. that would be the end of it. So yeah, every time they always got a chuckle, it always starts off serious. And then, yeah. and then when they cut back to the end of the story, they're yeah. all, you know, chuckle away. Yeah, so and that that actually happened here on I eighty uh, about a year and a half ago. Somebody had a sighting that one of these things crossed I eighty out west, and they talked about it, but they laughed about it on the news. Sure. Exactly what you said. Sure. So yeah, sure. I, I get it. Totally get it. You know, the only the only when I told when I, I've opened up, you know, the, the only people I haven't gotten flack for from in the past from I mean, back in my early days was. When I, you know, my grandma was Mohawk, I would talk to the natives about it. They were the only ones that did not ridicule me or make fun of me. Well, our natives here, the Coeur d'Alene tribe, they yep. don't even let people go. If you mention the word Bigfoot, they won't even mm-hmm. let you on their property. Right. They're, they're, it's totally different you know, to the you can say, natives. Hey, I want to go mushroom hunting. Okay. Yeah. Hey, have you have any Sasquatch activity? They they'll just tell you to go away. We don't want you here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stay away. You know, and you no, don't even I, want to bring it up. Don't you don't even don't, I don't even broach the subject with the tribe here. Yeah, and the other reason, like I said, the only reason I have in the past is with people, you know, my grandma knew, and you know, and that's how you know it's still hard to get info out of, even with having that connection. You know, just they keep it very close to the chest. Yeah, you know? well, I'm going to tell you uh, guys. Um, over the last couple of years, last year or so especially, there's been a few people in my life that have really helped. Yes. Uh, number one is Deb. Hatchel. Amazing woman. Um, her and her book that she wrote about uh, kids that see mm-hmm. things called The Fortunate Unfortunates. Yes. Um, that really, you know, helped me a lot. It, you know, it helped me kind of cope with what I saw as a child. Right, and I do exactly, and these kids do exactly the same thing I did. Either they tell somebody and get laughed at, or they shut up and never say anything. Right. And, yeah. Um, and also, a friend of mine, also from England, uh, his name's uh, Pete Hasty. He's uh, another uh, fellow nurse. Um, yeah. He and I talk about Bigfoot all the time. He's he's from England and very curious about uh, whether or not they exist there. And I'm like, why not? They're, the the sightings and um, a lot of the stuff that goes on in England predates ours by hundreds and hundreds of years. Sure it does. 
they, they have the woodwinds creature over yeah. there and uh you know it's on there in their scripture and in some of their biblical texts they have pictures of these things dra- drawn uh there's all kind of carvings of these like woodland beasts mm-hmm. not to mention stories and other pieces of artwork that include you know men fighting these hairy men monsters yep, yep. You no know, but um you know they they, they, whether they exist there or not, I don't know. I, they, they surely they could. They I'm, uh, I'm lying. I'm pretty sure they near there. Yeah, I think they're yeah. worldwide. Um, I think you know we know Australia has the Yowie. Oh yeah. Um, I don't know what I don't really know what Africa's got going on. You know, um, I've tried to look into that, and you really can't find much on it. I know, but they got that Macellum Abembe thing, a big dinosaur thing. Oh, the, yeah. Aside from that, I'm talking Sasquatch type creatures. Right. As far as Sasquatch goes, Africa's not really a hot spot. No, it's not. I mean, I you've got uh, Indonesia and Malaysia hot spots. Um, but, you know, in Africa, they have to worry about other things. Yes, like indeed. The lions and stuff. Now, a lion and a Sasquatch you know, that would be a hell of a scrap. Oh, yeah. Thing. For sure. And For sure. It would be like a, a Sasquatch and a grizzly bear. You know, that's, well, a 50, that's really like a 50 50 deal right there. Go to bigfootencounters.com. There's an article about, um, and sorry guys, it's going to sound redundant to you three or you two, but uh, it, it's a story about a guy, I forget who it was. Uh, they were hunting, you know, where the uh, Aleutian Islands off the chain off Alaska and come 40 miles within Siberia. Sure. They were hunting brown bear, okay? And they picked the one they found they saw one by a creek they dropped it well they get up next to it and they, there's there's tracks human like tracks all all over the place a set of large ones a set of medium sized ones to make a long story short and a set of small ones now the native guides told him this this happens often um what probably happened and it's by the way that the bear had been beaten up pretty good but it, it had also gotten a piece of whatever it was tussling with, too. You know, it was right. its claws were bloody, teeth were bloody, wh- whatever. Anyway, they got this thing opened up, and it's almost like something. Are you familiar with jujitsu at all? Jujitsu? Yes. Sure. I mean, I know it's a martial art. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, have you ever seen the way in jujitsu where you take someone's back and you throw a rear naked choke on them from the ground? Yes. yes. Okay, well, they said it had, when they had opened it up and taken the skin off, they could see bruises or this thing had almost, give it, it had been giving it the, the heel along the groin area. They could see a giant, a giant human-like bite in the muscle of the neck on top of where it had been scratched across the chest. So from what the native guides tell him, this does happen. Um, where, you know, the bear or whatever, the, the, the brown bears will interrupt the family that's fishing or, or whatever. And the male will tell the other ones to skedaddle, I'll handle this. And they get into it. Um, now, over there, we're talking about, you know, brown bears, that are 1,000 plus pounds, you know. Sure. So that would be a hell of a fight. But from what the natives told this guy, that they usually call it a stalemate. They stop because each species knows that an infection can lead to death very easily. Huh. But, well, yeah. Be, yeah. I mean, it makes sense. That, you would think that one or the other is going to be able to, you know, that it's per, they're pretty evenly matched. I would agree. You I would agree. One that has the opposable thumb, but you have right. also have one that has, you know, paws that are 12 inches wide. That's correct. Big mouth and teeth. Paws that are 8 inches long. Right. But I didn't mean to repeat that story again, J.R. Sean, but I I wanted to fill Joe in on it. Uh, If you get a chance, look it up. I'll have to look it up. Yeah, there's more to it. I've left some some detail. I I forget it. But just read up on it. You'll find it very interesting. Yeah, I will. I'll definitely do that. Um, Other than than, um, the two times that I've seen these creatures... um, like I said, I would have to honestly say, you know, they could very well be the same same animal, just from different regions, um, yeah. different diet. Um, but uh, this thing that I saw out here was a brute, man. I mean, yeah. this thing was as big as a widescreen television, enormously <sighs> wide. You know? That's a big boy. And it was just, it was, uh, I, I, 
I couldn't believe it. It was only 30 feet away. So it was like a like a living room length away from me. That's that's close. This thing. Very, I got a very good, very quick look at it. So yeah, Matt, but, that's um, uh, too close and, for comfort. And it was a very t- very tense forty five minutes. It really oh, was. Oh, I really, can just really imagine. Long, you know, we were out of there before. So, no, I don't know. Uh, we were probably gone by nine thirty. I guess uh, nine thirty nine forty five. Because it had just gotten dark, so I don't blame you. Um, I I bolted. So. I don't blame you, man. Um, you wanna uh, before we ran out of time, you wanna fill us in on your little four wheeler experience? Oh yeah, that happened. Uh, that would have been like in the late eighties. That's okay. Um, I was. Uh, I had just. I had just gotten home from basic training. Okay. And I went over to my buddy's house, and we were hanging out. Mrs. PA? Yeah. It was okay. in Pennsylvania. And up above his place, there was a place called Wesco, which was a Westmoreland County's uh, Jeep Association's, like, off-road uh, property. Uh-huh. And we used to sneak in the back door to it to ride uh, claws and dirt bikes and whatnot, or whatever we could get, a tractor or whatever. Anyway, well, we... We uh, took the. I, I had borrowed his quad. We he lived at the bottom of the hill, and now this had happened about three or four miles up at the top. Uh, they had just bought a nice new Polaris. Uh, when they first came out, uh, Polaris quads were pretty dependable, but they had the Stevie T transmission, and they were really, really dogs. I mean, they were just slow. They they were not a performance machine at all. Right. This was something you bought for your farm. Right. 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 So. But I took it up to the top of the hill, and I rode it back into Wesco, and I rode on some trails. And on my way coming out of the forest, you ever get that hair on the back of your neck stand up feeling the absolute dread, like a feeling of serious dread? Yes, like there's sir. something right behind me, or mm-hmm. I'm being chased. Yep. Well, something chased me, I, I would assume, that chased me out of those woods. How close it got, I do not know, or how it was doing that. Maybe this is where that infrasound thing comes in. Uh, maybe it wasn't even behind me at all. It could have been looking at me from a distance, doing this like infrasound thing on me. But I got it. I drove like a bat out of the hell as fast as this stupid Polaris would get me out of there. And I got out to the road, and as soon as I hit the main road, I I had to stop and puke. I puked my guts out. Mm-hmm. And then I limped the quad down the hill and went back down, you know. I I don't I didn't say anything to anybody. I just oh, what the hell am I gonna say? I just got scared and ran out of the woods. No, you're not gonna say that. So time that that time that abandoned farmhouse where that thing growled at me and Troy. Yeah, can you describe that growl to us a little bit? Okay. So once again, um, back uh, in Chestnut Ridge as a child, right up the road, about three miles up the road, um, there was an old abandoned farm called the Hoffer Place. And the far, the barn and the silo had long fallen down and everything, and it was all collapsed. But on the one side of the road was the old farmhouse, which was a wooden farmhouse with a shingle roof, and it had a stone foundation. And it didn't have any windows or doors in it. It was all dilapidated and abandoned. And uh, my friend and I, Troy, were walking one night. It was frozen, totally frozen night. The road was covered with ice and snow. The moon was out really bright. And we just were walking home from my friend Gary Tarr's house. And we stopped in front of this house because there was a bit of a hill. And we just got to stop there before we started climbing the hill to take a little break. And we're talking and we're looking at this house. And all of a sudden, out of, the, out of this house came the loudest guttural, like, Rrr, growl. I could never, I was like, it like shook my feet, you know? And we didn't even wait. We just ran. I mean, they, and we got, we ran about a quarter mile and we got into the woods. And once we got into the woods, we're like, dude, what the hell was that? You know? Yeah. So. I've always wanted yeah. to find Troy. I've tried looking him up on Facebook. He, I can't find him. He's just one of those no Facebook people. So yeah. it's, hard, it's hard to track down. I can't find the kid anywhere. 
Right. But I always wanted to say, hey, man, do you remember that night we were out and that thing growled us from the basement of that old house? You know, it, you know? It, it does make sense, though, that, you know, it's an abandoned place in the middle of the woods. You know, why yeah. wouldn't they take to cover there? Sure, you know? they gotta be, they got to be in somewhere. They you got to get covered somewhere. So. Exactly. Exactly. But um, um, you guys, like you said, um, I know we're kind of coming out at the end of time here. But if you have any questions, if you have anything you want to know, um, Jeremiah, you have my email. Please feel free, feel free to share it. Yes, I will. I'll for I'll sure happy. with Sean and JR. Definitely for sure. I'll be happy to share anything, any questions you might have, or, or if you need like GPS coordinates or locations, awesome. or pictures, or anything. As far as these encounters go, I, I, I'll, I'll be more than happy to help you out. Awesome. You know, uh, Joe, if, uh, you know, you know, anyone of three of us are always game to talk squash. Everyone uh, swap ideas, uh, you know, anything like that. Pick each other's brains. We're more than happy to do it. Absolutely. Yeah, that sounds good. And you guys like said, anytime you want to get a hold of me, please feel free. So. Here, and these uh, these two are my brothers. We're uh, we're more like brothers than than friends, you know. So you can you can these guys same as me, you know. You can trust these guys just like me. So uh, awesome, you know. That's they're awesome both good people. Um, also, I, I said my stepson had an encounter back in two thousand seven. Let's hear about really, that real quick, if you don't mind okay, getting into I it. Can, I can run through that one pretty fast. Okay. Only because only because I would really like to take my time on this one because this one was investigated by Stan Gordon. Oh, okay. And he said I understand. And, stuff and, and there's a much better story behind it. Okay. It actually kind of went on for a couple of days. Right. But uh, yeah, we we went on. We had a family vacation back in 2007. Uh, we went to Gettysburg for over Halloween. Oh. And we came back and it was me and my wife and my stepson and my son. And when we got back, um, while we were in Gettysburg, I had uh, bought the boys these uh, slingshots. These like this cheap wooden Y slingshots, right? And uh, two or three days after we got back, uh, Jonathan had gone to school and come home after school and wanted to go out and play with his slingshots with with Parker. So they went out and played after school for a little bit, and then they came in the house. And we were watching that. I was like laying in bed, like half asleep. I can't remember if it was the Steeler game was on or what. I don't remember. There was something going on. We, anyway, uh, no, it wasn't the Steeler game. It was something else, maybe volleyball. Anyway, we were watching something, dozing off in bed. And Jonathan went outside because he forgot his slingshot back in the corner of the yard. So we went out to get it. And a couple seconds later, the, the front door slams. He comes running upstairs freaking out saying that there's something in the backyard you know what he saw i'm like yeah i totally blew him off because we were getting ready to go bowling i'm like dude we'll talk about it later just get, get your clothes on and let's we're gonna go bowling so we went bowling and then we went to denny or to wendy's after afterwards and i said oh jonathan by the way what, what exactly did you see earlier and this is where he tells us about going out playing coming in playing video games then going back outside to get his slingshot, and on his way to find to get the slingshot, there was a Bigfoot standing in the fort where him and Parker had been playing. Interesting. Uh, that was uh, seven foot tall, uh, long brown and gray hair. Um, that's the one I sent you that footprint of, that really sharp footprint. Yeah, I've got it. If you do, yeah, do you mind if I share that with the guys after? And uh, yeah, so we, I, I, I didn't want to like, I, I knew what it was like. Guys, I knew what it was like to be ridiculed and laughed at. Sure, this. sure. So I said, I took the guitar seriously. I said, well, let's find, let's find some investigators. Let's get some people on this, you know. So we got online, and the same one name kept popping up. It was Stan Gordon. Stan Gordon. Mm -hmm. I called Stan Gordon up, and he sent out two of his fellow researchers. They were there in like 15 minutes. Nice. They went back in the woods with their like headlamps on and all that and their cameras. And they came out a few minutes later and said, guys, do not go back there. Don't, we don't want anything disturbed. Yeah. So I'm like, buddy, hey, nobody <laughs> going back there. No way. <laughs> it, was, it was all like swampland. It, uh, it was the Army Corps of Engineers flood control. Uh, I'm like, okay. going back in there anyway. 
and uh, so uh, so Stan and his compatriots came back the next morning and they went back there and they found a nice trackway ran about nice. 200 feet from that first print that I showed you yep. all, the into the, all the way into the swamp and um, they found some other they found a knuckle bark where it had gone under a short under a branch they found a nice knuckle dig where it had put its hand its fist into the ground going under a low branch nice and uh yeah it's it's in that picture you can't really see it or maybe it's not in that picture it's, it's a picture of that print where you can see uh, the knuckle let me check and, it, um, it, it was an interesting sighting and i'm glad that i did that. i'm glad i reported it and stan wrote about it in one of his books he brought it up in one of the chapters of one nice. of his books so uh, but he showed me a cast. Stan Gordon had taken a cast in 1984, about a quarter mile away from where we were. Um, right, it's called Derry, Pennsylvania. And uh, he uh, had taken a cast, and he sent me a photograph of the cast that he had. It was the exact same print, man. Same, same creature. Same creature. Exact same creature. Yep. Twenty years that's, later. That's a beautiful print. Yeah. Now, like I said, this was 20 years later. That's amazing. Same exact creature. So it had to be like along a migratory route. This sure. thing about the same time. This this was taken in uh, late October, and this was on November fourth. Hmm. Wow! And I just noticed that's that's pretty damn deep. Yeah, that, that, there's. I showed you the one my my wife's uh, boot print. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm looking at now. Her, her, her boot print versus what that thing was. Yeah, yeah, that's that's it's pretty deep. No, is that the, pounds, so. Oh, easily. Is that the one of the knuckle print? Or, no, or is yeah, that something yeah. different? The I can print, see it. The knuckle print is about three feet to the left of that print. About, okay. About 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock off of the print. You know? Like a, if know, it was I, a clock, it would be about 11. The knuckle Yeah. Would be I, I don't know if I can pull it. I'm looking at my cell right now, so that's probably not why I'm getting the whole. No, I I, I will send you a better picture of it. I have several okay. pictures. Of that. I have pictures I of other prints too. So. But I can see a there's a mark an impression. that looks kind of like a like a knuckle mark, man, right above your wife's uh, uh, that green outline. Okay, so if it's if it looks like uh, three fingers or more sunk into the mud, and it's like rectangular. That might be it, but if not, I can get you a better picture. Okay, that'd be great. That'd be great. I'll look through my stuff and find it. It's on my one tablet. I'll have to go dig it out and charge it up, okay? I don't That's not a problem. Phone. Take your time, man. No no big deal. Yeah, I don't have it on my phone. I'll have to charge up my tablet and send you. I'll send you all the pictures I have from that. Great, and you don't mind if I share them with my partners, correct? Oh, but absolutely. Feel free, man. Feel and I'm gonna, uh, I'll hook you guys. I'll uh, you know, send them. If you don't mind, I'll send them your uh, email and stuff too, because we're all three of us are one, you know. Uh, all right. And, so, uh, I, I thank you guys very much for the chance. No, thank you, thank you, Joe. It's, it's always I find the best way to deal with these things is to talk about it. Yes, absolutely. If you don't, yeah. then it's going to drive you insane, man. So. Man, if I didn't have these guys to talk to, and I wasn't able to get it off my chest with other people like this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, I'd, I'd be a mess. I really would. Yeah, yeah, same here. You know, well, I'd love to hear everybody's uh, encounters. I mean, can I? Where can I hear about yours, Sean or Jr.? What do we got? Yeah, uh, got I some did, stuff. <laughs> I did a. Uh, uh, I was on Sasquatch Chronicles, and Will Jevning. I've done a couple with him. I've done. Inter I did a one-on-one -on -one with these guys with this group, and um, I think that Odyssey. Joe, I actually, did one with Carrie Arnold. Just search on that. I, I did care. Last encounter on Sasquatch and Crown, uh, Chronicles. Okay, well, I'll have to look them up. Uh, them up. Actually, Joe, you know what? I'm gonna sell, I'll send it to you right now. Yeah, if you want to send me the links, that'd be great. That yeah, makes, that I, 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 uh, Sean did, Sean's encounter is, is, is awesome. Um, I can't wait to hear it. And the poor guy. Imagine seeing one of these things with just, with just a bow on you. Ooh. Yeah, I mean, I saw one carrying a, black, a blue plastic roll-up sled once. That's all I had. <laughs> I had that same sled, man. I had a red one when I was a kid, and you're right. They yeah, they even called like the magic it carpet sucks. or some shit. They were yeah. terrible. Garbage. Horrible. Garbage. What's wrong with you rich kids? 
<laughs> Here we go. Hey, man, Here we go. My favorite sled was the hood of an old Ford. There you go. Yeah, so a, you, the simplest things were the best. I had a Yankee Clipper, man. My dad uh, was the greatest thing. He would polish the, the runners up on it with a wire brush, you know, on the end of a drill. And yes. then he'd put wax, he'd put wax on the blades for me. Uh-huh. And he'd help me up behind his pickup truck and drag me down the road. Yeah, awesome. like forty-five miles an hour, man. It was a blast. Yep. That is awesome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah I, I, uh, today than it was when we were younger. It is. It's a lot different for sure. I just so, sent you John's encounter uh, on the, this show. Um, very good. Jr. actually has some good stuff when he gets some time to tell you about. Uh, um, and you, I told you mine. I, right. I, pretty sure um but yeah anytime man we're more than happy to talk to you anytime you want you know now that we're all you know uh yeah. doing, working with yeah, dad now you know as well anything new let me know oh we'll definitely That's keep so. you in the loop man for sure we really enjoyed so, this I, I, I hope you guys have a good evening you know thank you ever no, so much again. i really appreciate it yes, sir, no, we, you, we appreciate it yeah, thank you very much, Joe. We we really appreciate it. And um, you got any? Uh, let's do our last. We do a ritual for the show as it ends every night. Uh, and I'll give you the honors first to our our witness, Joe. What do you have for advice to people out there that want to get into this field? Um, just know that these things are real. Put the fact or any thought out of your mind that they do not exist. They mm-hmm. do exist. They have existed, and they will continue to exist. Mm-hmm. No matter if whether human beings are here or not, I believe these creatures were here before us, and they'll yes. be here after us. That's right. Very, just, very, uh, very, just very need, good. Advice. Just need the rest of society to come around to the idea that they exist, and please be careful. Don't go alone. And um, you know, I don't know how a lot of people feel differently about the thing going armed. It's always best to have a gun yeah. and yeah. not need it than to yeah. need it and not have it. You got three three guys here that agree with you fully on that. So, trust me. Well, thank you for your yeah, some pretty good advice. Thank you, uh, Jr. Yeah, man. Um, I'd say just uh, be smart enough to know what not to do, and uh, don't ever try to bluff one of these things. Which that's probably in the cars you're probably going to pick up and run. And <laughs> just like I did, I thought I was. Yeah. A <laughs> I knew that was coming. I'm badass, man. I've got a, I've got a four wheel, I've got a shotgun rifle and four wheel drive. And when that damn thing, when I heard that thing stomping after me and huff, man, I was, I was gone. I was gone. <laughs> you, know, you, can't, you can't even really think about it. other stuff. You can't think about pulling triggers when something like that's chasing you. No, of course not. I'm oh, so freaking gone, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like I heard my sister and my wife, man, it's just a rush. That's why we do it. That's why. We, that's why we're in this. That's right. In that education, and you know the whole nine. But yeah, thanks, thanks, Jr. What's uh, how can people reach you for questions? Yeah, man, mine's on the trail. Dot J K at AOL dot com. That's right. You got the special one. Yeah, that's right. you got a special one because I'm the special guy. So please, that, 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 that is correct. <laughs> John, uh, what are your last words of wisdom, man? Words of wisdom about getting into the field. No, you're uh, – read up on this stuff, you know. Um, read up on it. Listen to other people's encounters. Don't go out there alone, just like Joe said. Do arm yourself. Make sure you're armed well. Um, a good flashlight if you're going at night, something that will mm-hmm. blind one of these things. I mean, you take something at least 5,000 lumens and – you put that in its face, you're going to have a chance to get away because it'll be blind for a few minutes. I agree. I, I think it hurts your night vision. Yeah, bear mace, air horns, stuff like yeah. that. And don't don't go alone. Yeah, yeah. That's about it. You know, be, oh, uh, add, is always let somebody know where you're going to be. Oh yeah, so, the three of us do that, that constant. Yep, common yeah. practice between three of us for sure. Yeah. Just, you know, <laughs> Call your, neighbor, call your buddy, whoever, and just say, hey, I'm going to be up wherever for the next yep. couple hours. That's you right. Know, just That's so right. You know where I'm. That's right. I didn't answer Jeremiah. I can know where to start to look for my shoes at. <laughs> <laughs> say what? I do that so Jeremiah. I can at least know where to look. For, 
where to start to look for my shoes. That, that's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. At least I can, I got a starting point. <laughs> <I never. laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, Sean, do you have anything else to add? How can people reach you, man? Um, on the trail sw at gmail dot com, and uh, that's about it, buddy. That's all I got. All right, man. And uh, you know, to end it out, I gotta agree with these guys on everything they just said. Joe, I agree with everything he said. Jr. John, as usual, you know, and you can reach me at on the trail dot jf at gmail dot com. Like I said, Jr. is the special one with the AOL. So Sean and I are the peasants with Gmail. But uh, anyway, that's just how it worked out. <laughs> no, we, as you notice, Joe, we like picking on each other a little bit. That's, that's quite all right, guys. Nothing wrong with that at all. No, yeah, the way I always see it, man, is if you don't have a little bit of fun when you're doing this kind of stuff, it's going to drive you crazy. Yeah, I agree. I agree. You know? But thank you very much, sir, for coming on. We appreciate sure, it. I hope and, everyone uh, has a great evening. Yeah, and I will. Uh, I'll get these guys your info right now, and uh, you guys can keep in touch as you and I do, Joe. You know. All right. Yeah, man. Any time. My if anybody's interested. Or yeah. Anybody throw your email. Listening. Throw your email out there, man. If anybody's listening to this and they have any questions or anything they want to ask me, uh, my email is sonarsasswatch at gmail dot com. Yep. And I believe uh, the two, the three of us have it through Dev already. I think yeah, so. You guys are pretty well connected. So. Yeah. I hope everybody has a good evening and stay safe in the woods, please. Absolutely, Joe. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. All right. Take sure care. Thanks, Joe. Cheers. Cheers.